The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon Chani report, and uh, we have Yuval Steinitz with us, who is a member of the Knesset Likud. If you recall, and we hope you do, because we hope you're loyal to us, and we believe you are, uh, Yuval was on the show about four or five months ago. Now, let me tell you some outstanding uh, facets about the personality and the Knesset member. Number one, he was a member of Peace Now, which is an extreme left-wing part of the group in Israel that's searching for peace uh, on a very uh, diligent, in a very diligent way. And then he flipped and he did 180 degrees and he's now a member of Likud and maybe a little bit on the right side of Likud. So that was fascinating. Aside from that, he's a professor of philosophy. So put that into one goulash and you got a very exciting, interesting member of Knesset. More importantly, perhaps, is that he's uh, chairman of the Subcommittee on Defense Planning, which is extremely important. And he's in the United States for a few days, so we grabbed him for an interview. Yuval, welcome. Thank you. What brings you here, by the way? Although every Israeli I know is on his shuttle to New York lately. <laughs> <laughs> the two, two main purposes. First, I, I came to meet uh, many Jewish leaders, and some uh, congressmen, and uh, Jinsa in order to raise the issue of a very dangerous, I would say, arms sales, new arms sales, and sophisticated weapons. Right, you got to explain to, to the Egypt. audience who Jinsa is. Well, Jinsa is a very uh, interesting establishment. It is the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, which take care of strengthening both American national security and the ties between uh, defense establishments here in America and there but in they Israel. They have many ex-generals who help you and who are not Jewish, am I correct? Yes, yes, and uh, it's really a pleasure for me right. once a year to meet a group of ex-generals, about 30 or 40 of them, uh, um, uh, who are coming from the state to Israel to see and to uh, uh, examine Israel's strategic position. And it's always a great pleasure to discuss our problems and uh, with them. So they're really interested in the mutual defense of Israel and the United States. In other words, they believe that if Israel is strong security-wise, it's good policy for the United States. Is that it, basically? Yes, I, and I think that it is uh, 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 very clear that this is so. First, if Israel is strong, then this helps to stabilize the Middle East because the moment Israel is weak, or the moment somebody believes that Israel is weak and vulnerable, this immediately destabilizes the region and invites a war or conflict. Second, and I think that this is the most fundamental proposition of Jinsa, that democracies, big and little democracies, should stand together. And uh, Israel and the United States is two of the most vivid democracies in the world. Do they have a lot of power in Congress uh, in terms of lobbying? Do, are, are they powerful? I think lobbying, connections, uh, uh, yes. The Israeli uh, government, uh, let's say Arik Sharon, is he uh, in favor of uh, this organization working on behalf of Israel? Um, I think all the prime ministers were, am I correct? Yes, uh, last uh, February, or not February, uh, March. I had the opportunity to meet together with Ariel Sharon, both of us, with 35, I think, generals of Jinsa in his office. Uh, ex -generals. To conclude, ex generals, ex -generals. to conclude a one week tour of 35 American ex generals in Israel with visits uh, in the IDF. And in, uh, you take it very, very seriously. I know it's a very active group and uh, yes. it's a very important group. I used to know a fellow named Bruce Williams, who was a military attaché during the Jimmy Carter days. Mm -hmm. And after he left the uh, service, he became a very 
a strong member of Jinsa. There also was a general in Israel, he died, Musa Pelad, who had a very active participation. He believed very yes, much in I think Jinsa. many people in the defense establishment here, right. in the Pentagon, even Paul Wolfowitz, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, was right. a member of Jinsa's board. Really? Just a few years ago, yes. So I, it was very important to me to raise the issue. All right, so your issue is Egypt. You want to stop the United States from uh, giving uh, new defense uh, supplies to Egypt, is that it? Uh, very special uh, uh, defense supplies or weapon systems. Look, Such as? And let me just say very briefly, until now, the Egyptians got the best platforms in air, land, and sea from the United States, like F-16 jets, like Abrams M1 tanks, and like uh, new brigades. In the last three years, we see a new development, that they are getting also the best weapon systems to deploy on those uh, platforms. And this might harm Israel's technological edge. Look, we are very little and the Arab world around us is very big in territory and population. So it is vital for us to keep the technological edge, the technological superiority, in order to compensate for the almost impossible uh, uh, minuscule size of Israel. And if now uh, we find a new generation of, of missiles and uh, sophisticated weapons in Egypt, this might influence the balance of powers in the Middle East and uh, we are very concerned about it, especially that we take into account the very, very hostile approach of Egypt to Israel and to the entire West. The terrible incitement against the West, but all the more so against Israel in Egyptian media and Egyptian education system. system. And the fact that the basic indoctrination in the Egyptian army is that we have to prepare ourselves to a future, to a possible future conflict with Israel. Now, what is now uh, under consideration is two systems of weapons which are very, very harmful and dangerous from our perspective. One is a new generation of Harpoon missiles. The Harpoon is C2C missiles that we and the Egyptians and other friends of the United States got already long ago. But the new generation is a little cruise missiles that can hit targets deep in land, very accurate, and be very accurate. And since Israel is so little, each target, each building, each military installation, each reactor inside Israel will be threatened by Egyptian harpoons from ships or from F-16 airplanes. And this is a real concern. It will make Israel's defense much more difficult than before. Maybe very legitimate. My guess is that uh, George Bush is not going to do anything to harm his relationship right now with Egypt. He's uh, Egypt and and obviously King Hussein of Jordan are very important now in his coalition against Afghanistan. So you may have a a uh, moral uh, right in the sense to be a little bit outraged, but. This is only my opinion. My guess is that the Bush cannot do anything with Egypt right now. Well, let me just mention that the United States have an excellent record in creating its own enemies. You know, in the, and one cannot ignore it. In the beginning, and I'm not speaking about bin Laden, in the beginning the United States supported Iran and enabled Iran under the corrupted regime of the Shah to become a regional superpower because Iran was considered to be uh, supportive uh, to the West and against the Soviet bloc. Then the government was toppled in Iran and it became your enemy. So the United States shifted to Iraq and enabled together with some European countries Iraq to become a regional superpower. And the idea was that Iraq uh, as a regional superpower will balance Iran and will become a buffer state between Iran and the Arab Peninsula, and, and the oil fields in Kuwait and Saudi. Then when Iraq became strong enough, it turned against the West and became a threat in itself. Now United States shifted again, and the idea, at least under the Clinton administration, was let's enable Egypt to become a regional superpower in order to balance both Iran and Iraq. And I think that with such kind of not exactly democratic and open societies, 
one should be very careful not to repeat uh, 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 this you mistake may, you in, may, in, in the same you time. You may be 100% correct, but I'm telling you today that policy will stand. Bush cannot, in my opinion, change that policy, and your facts are very correct. Uh, I know very well what happened in Iran. I was involved with the hostage crisis. Uh, uh, and, but by the way, the Israelis had a great relationship with the Shah also, and you know that, under the blankets. They were always involved, uh, your friend uh, Mr. Nimrodi was the military attaché there, and uh, I know that uh, the defense minister used to travel there all the time, he used to do a lot of business with the Shah. Well, I completely agree. So let's conclude that both Israel and the United <laughs> States should learn from experience and don't repeat well, the well, mistakes of, yeah, of, you, of very uh, you about, uh, past. Aside from being a philosopher, you're, you're up to date on everything. Would you believe that 10 years ago the United States and Russia would be forming this alliance against Afghanistan? I mean, the world changes, right? Yes. Geopolitics change all the time. I think if I was an Israeli, if I were an Israeli, and I saw that uh, someone was being armed uh, to a greater degree than I was, I'd also put my complaints in there very strongly. And you bring out a very interesting point, and I, I, I've talked about this many times. I don't believe that America should believe that every country in the world can be democratic. There are certain countries. There is no Arab democracy, correct? Yes. You know any? Maybe I don't no, know. Maybe not, in Belize not, not through democracies. There are not and even democracies. Arab uh, 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 leaders in Israel or, or in some Arab countries will admit that. Uh, right. So, 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 but sometimes you know we Americans uh, we're very unusual. We believe in due process and democratic principles, but you need to travel a little bit and get out of uh, Milwaukee and uh, in the Boise, Idaho, and see what the world looks like. And you cannot control so such a mass of people in a democratic way. Otherwise, uh, you're, you're overthrown and toppled all the time, and nothing happens. We see what happens in Afghanistan. It's all tribal. You know, you've got many tribes running around. There's no authenticity to any type of government. So poor people get killed and become refugees and okay, starving, and since et cetera. We, first, I'm not so pessimistic. I do believe that in the end, as we saw in South America and as we saw in East Europe, there are chances for uh, uh, dem democratizations also in Africa and in the Arab world. But at present, if this is so, one should be very careful not to create its own enemies, not to strengthen potential uh, enemies or adversaries of the United States and, and, and the Western civilization. Yeah, I agree with you. I think you'd have a hard time convincing. And, and, and let me add, sorry to interrupt, and not to sacrifice your true allies and friends like uh, as the state of Israel. No fight here, but I'm saying politically I think you'd have a tough time convincing Congress to uh, to uh, be a, bit, a little bit tough to Egypt today. It's just the geopolitics aren't there at this moment. Which leads me to another subject. We have a terrible fear in this country of anthrax. What, what is going on in Israel in terms of uh, the Israeli position. Are you well prepared for that type of thing? I think so. Uh, well, one cannot be 100% totally, no, uh, 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 prepared, but I think that we are quite well prepared. And anyhow, since we are facing similar threats of, of terror and also non-conventional uh, weapons for so long, um, it is less dramatic. The new developments are, are less dramatic and people in Israel are less panic. Uh, because you get used to it at the end, and we are living, right. we are lucky enough to live in a very interesting, but a very, very difficult region of, of, of uh, uh, Arab uh, dictatorship, of tyrannies, and of uh, great hostility to the West in general and to Israel in particular. Right, let me skip around a little bit, because while we got you here, we want to ask you a lot of things about what's going on in Israel. Azmi Bashara, who is a Knesset member, an Arab Knesset member, made some statements which were believed to be anti-Israel in Syria. And they lifted his, his immunity about a week ago, am I correct? Yes, yes we left. I voted you, for it, yes. <laughs> I did, right. 
Uh, what, what do you think will happen here? I think this is a huge watershed event in, in the history of Israel. Mm -hmm. What it does is say, look, if you're a member of the Knesset, you, you have to be, uh, you have to salute the flag in essence, and you have to be uh, dedicated to the state of Israel and the preservation of its security. You have some Israeli Arab Knesset members who are totally destructive of that concept. So how can you stay in a Knesset when you don't salute the flag and, and, and really you're not a loyalist? It, it's yes. nearly impossible. So I think it's a watershed event. Yes, but it is even more than that. We are very flexible in Israel about such phenomena until now. We don't really demand somebody to show loyalty to the state of Israel. And we accept very difficult criticism and even hostile criticism to the state of Israel. But here, even in Israel, even in such an open democracy, and there should be red lines. And what Azmi Bishara did is not even incitement, but a clear case of treason. Because once he moved to Syria, which is an enemy state, right. and he participated as a guest of honor in a ceremony in which leaders of the Hezbollah called to destroy the state of Israel, not just to fight against him, but to destroy it for the destruction of the Jewish state, of the state of Israel. And he supported it. This is a clear case of treason. Is he going to be tried for treason now? No, I, 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 I criticize Israel's general... Uh, Attorney, Attorney General, Attorney general uh, uh, that uh, the allegations that so were what, made is were he, He's going to be indicted, right? He, yes. Or he is indicted? No, no, he's going to have a trial for... Okay, for so you got to be indicted before you have a trial. That's the American way of doing it. So, so Bashara was, his immunity was lifted, and now he's a plain citizen. Now the attorney... No, no, let, let me... Yeah, go ahead. It. He's not a plain citizen, he's still a member of the Knesset. But he has no immunity. He has no immunity only on those specific cases. Right, okay. His, his general immunity kept for, for other cases. Okay. It is not that he is completely vulnerable, so he has, he like has a, any uh, simple so if he, if he has a, a parking ticket, uh, he has immunity, but uh, he's not immune for treason yes. in Syria. Yes. So he has a limited immunity now, but one of the part has been lifted. In that part that has been lifted, he's like a private citizen. Yes. Okay, so now he's going to be tried. It's going to be a huge trial, I'm sure, because he's a publicity-hungry guy and a very smart one. So now he's going to be tried for what? For treason or for no. uh, the allegation incitement? Both, yes, incitement and encourage, encouraging terrorist organizations to fight against Israel. There is specific... Right. Uh, I see. Uh, 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 and what is the punishment for that? Several years in prison. Few years in prison. It's not the treason. Who, who, who is defending him now? An Arab lawyer or, or a, uh, an Israeli Jewish lawyer? I don't know. I don't think he's, uh, he already announced. His, uh, it's going to be a huge trial. I mean, he's uh, he's a uh, he's part of uh, the gang of philosophers, which you are, and he got his degree from the university, I think, in Berlin. Uh, we had him on the show in, in East Berlin, East Berlin, in communist Berlin, before the fall of right. the world. So he's a red uh, he's a red philosopher. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> one could say. <laughs> Yes. It's a big event, though, you know, in, in Israel's history. I think it's very important. Yes, but it's very important to put a red line. Although, yeah, I uh, agree. although our lines are very, very soft in comparison to the United States or to England. Yes, if you, if you examine uh, 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 what the British did during the Second World War, so members of parliament, there was one case who supported or expressed sympathy to Hitler. Uh, or Lord Howe, uh, who moved to Germany and incited against Britain during the war, uh, were judged uh, on treason and uh, executed. So we are not going to You're execute, not going to execute anybody. For sure. yes. right, we got to cut for a break, and we'll come right back. We'll talk with Yuval Steinitz, who was a member of the Knesset Likud. I told you he did a reverse. So he was in peace now, now he's in Likud, and we're going to ask him about what's happening today. Shimo Perez is in town. He came with him, I believe, and. Uh, Shimon Peres, I think, is moving towards a new peace plan, which may not make him very happy. And uh, it looks like the United States is going to finally get involved. I think General Powell is uh, starting to rev it up a little bit, but we'll ask him. We'll be right back. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. 
Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening. A book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. We're back. We're talking with Yuval Steinmetz, uh, Knesset member, Likud, used to be Peace Now, and in the visit here with uh, Shimon Peres and Yal Dayan. Uh, Shimon Peres, uh, he's on the other side of the uh, loop for you. You know, when I was in Israel a few weeks ago, uh, Shimon Peres was uh, looked upon with askance. People really were upset with him. Uh, they felt that he was trying to make these meetings with uh, Yasser Arafat and basically the country didn't want to see that. There had been too much terrorism, and uh, they blame Arafat for all this terrorism. Has anything changed in those couple of weeks? Not really, but I think that the reason is not just the current wave of violence, but that people in Israel realized, including people in the left, like Shlomo Ben-Ami, Shochat, former ministers in the Labour right. Party, that Arafat cannot be a real partner for peace, that he is unable to drop as a Palestinian legacy of the destruction of Israel. And therefore, any negotiation or discussions with him uh, will be non-productive. What is the new Paris peace plan that's been heralded all over the place? What is it? Do you know? No, nobody knows. I'm not confident that Paris himself knows. But anyhow, let me tell you something. I'm very interested in peace, but not in raising meaningless peace plans because for peace you need a partner and for successful negotiation if we want really one day to find an end to the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians agreement that's the name of my book by the way yes confronting the Israeli Arab conflict ah, you yes. were at the book party <laughs> yes <laughs> but I didn't manage to read the book yet uh, but I, I hope to do it you will on the plane anyhow Raising uh, uh, planes again and again without having a partner, a real partner, and a real partner is not uh, doesn't have to accept your your own positions immediately, but to have a good will, a real will to put an end to this conflict is useless and maybe even harmful. So I'm not enthusiastic about new peace plans until two things happen. First. And this is the most important thing, that the already written agreements, the Oslo agreements, A and B, and the Y memorandum, will finally be obeyed, will finally be fulfilled by the other side. At least the most basic I and fundamental Sharon, issue. But I think Eric Sharon, your prime minister, said that Oslo is dead. Am I correct? I think so, but if, if you want to revive the peace process... Well, aren't you reviving it basically on the Mitchell plan and the Tenet plan? No, the Mitchell and Tenet plan are not the plans for, uh, for peace talks, but just to resuming the uh, 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 basic ceasefire and negotiation. So I would say that if we want to see any progress in the future in the peace process between Israelis and Palestinians, between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, First, we have to take care to see that the already existing, already written agreements 
are being fulfilled. Right. At least in the most fundamental things, like the cessation of violence, like the arms control limitations, and like the end of this terrible incitement against Israel and against Jews. And then, if you see that the already existing agreements are being obeyed by both sides, then you have a real prospect or a real hope to try to reach a future I agreement. Understand. And yep. this agreement won't become just a, another sheet of paper. You think that's reality now? That's a possibility? No, I'm, I'm not optimistic for the short run. By I the think way, we are uh, going to face two or three very difficult years for Israel's survival because we already made enormous sacrifice and concessions in our effort to reach peace with the Palestinians and we are getting war and terror instead and we are uh, we all we already shaken our strategical position but I am not pessimistic for the long run I believe that if we shall find one day a new Palestinian leadership that will be more flexible and a new generation of leaders that will be able to drop the legacy, the, the idea of so you're the destruction for, of you're Israel, waiting, you're waiting we will have new Arafat chances. To retire. By the way, Yossi Balin, the former Minister of Justice, and Abu Rabo, I think, are, they were touring the United States trying to uh, star, rev up this uh, peace, uh, I guess, negotiations, and they're trying to, in a sense, lobby the United States government to push that peace process Leon, forward. Let me be very clear about this point, which is widely ignored, also by the Americans. There is no use. You don't have a part? The process itself is not the issue. The issue is to put an end to the conflict and to reach a final peace agreement and, and also stability in the region. So I'm not so enthusiastic about resuming the process and resuming negotiation. For eight years now we are negotiating with the Palestinians. We, are already, we already made very dramatic concessions, including territorial concessions. We already delivered most of Gaza Strip and f approximately 40% of the West Bank to Arafat's control. And instead of peace, we are getting war and terrorism. And instead of more stability and security in the Middle East, we are getting less stability. And instead of more security, we are getting greater existential threat to the state of Israel. So the issue is not just to resume negotiation with Arafat. The issue is to take the whole process to completely different right, direction, so to the positive direction and not to the negative direction. Okay, so you think this uh, Balin Abu Raba uh, journey to America is really a waste of time because you really don't have leadership on the other side that could commit to a real peace treaty. Yes, maybe, maybe we shall succeed to resume the ceasefire and to resume negotiation with Arafat for several months and then again we, we had many ups and downs. Uh, in those uh, eight years. All right, what was the reaction in Israel to George Bush when he said that he believes there should be a Palestinian state? I don't think that was a big deal anymore, no, right? No, everybody no. agrees on that, right? Yes, because uh, this is, it's, it, everybody understands that the Oslo process naturally lead to two-state solution. Everybody is ready to see, or not everybody, but many people also in the Israeli right are ready to see a, a very limited and demilitarized Palestinian state if, if it will be demilitarized and if we shall have the minimal security zones to ensure Israel's security in this difficult region. But I found that Bush's speech was very positive on two other points. He made two tremendously important propositions or statements. One, that one cannot expect any progress in the peace process unless Secession. the already uh, existing agreements and the basic cessation of violence underlying the whole process is being resumed. And second, that there are no two kinds of terrorism. The terrorism is not to be judged according to its cause. And it makes no difference if the cause is purely ideological. Uh, Islamic hostility against the West, like in the Bin Laden case, or national, like in the case of Arafat. But terrorism is to be judged according to its means, according to the idea of shifting 
of, of, of uh, uh, fighting civilians, of terrorizing civilians, instead of fighting military forces. Charlie Rangel, who's a prominent member of Congress, spoke to me last week, and he said that the term freedom fighter has been abolished. They're all terrorists. This term freedom fighter doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a big uh, uh, follower, or uh, you've always been in the Bibi Netanyahu camp. Is that correct or incorrect? Yes, I am still. All right. Why do you think <coughs> Bibi Netanyahu could do better than Arik Sharon as the leader of the country? Look, I, I really hope that Arik Sharon will succeed to resume at least the personal security of the people of Israel. But uh, Bibi, uh, in his three years in office, got very good results on both economy. The economy was recovering from enormous deficit and foreign investments in Israel were uh, uh, rising, and both in, uh, on the defense issues, because during Bibi's term in office, terrorist activity, terrorist operations in Israel was reduced sharply. Why, why was that? It's, was so that his policy? Was it's that difficult, defense? You know what, it is difficult to analyze. I know. I have my own analysis. I think that if you take uh, 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 the release of uh, Sheikh Yassin from jail, the Hamas spiritual leader, right. you can clearly notice that since Sheikh Yassin was released from jail, terrorist activity against Israel was sharply reduced for almost three years. But this is a very complex issue. But let me just uh, say that Bibi had another success. He succeeded to reduce Palestinians' expectations, as we saw in Y. And this is, was very Expectations? important. Expectations? Yes. Well, how? How did he do it? He went to Y agreement. Bibi Netanyahu, who I think is a bright guy, made an absolute promise to the people of Israel he wouldn't talk to Arafat. He did. Political, you know, rhetoric. You know, four, 19 guys got killed in a tunnel at that time. You remember in Jerusalem? Yes. Another mistake. Uh, Arak Sharon. No one can say that he was not a great general in the history of Israel. Great general, everybody agrees. I just don't see the difference. I don't know why the Likud doesn't stay together with Sharon and give him a little chance, because I know the internal polls in the Likud show that if Bibi Netanyahu would run against Sharon tomorrow, he would beat him. Yes, it's The irony in the country is that Sharon is very popular, but not in his own party. No, but let's distinguish two things, because there is no inconsistency. First, the Likud is giving a great support to Ariel Sharon, and all members of the Likud in the Knesset are voting for the government and supporting Ariel Sharon, including myself. But you are right that uh, when there will be general elections and there will be primaries inside the Likud, Bibi have very good chances to prevail. Absolutely. And I think for very good reasons. As I said before, it's not that Sharon is not successful the, prime you, minister. You think it's more economic? I think, that, I think that Bibi was highly successful uh, Prime Minister of the, of the State of Israel if you examine him, uh, if you examine the end results of, of his period, of his, of his term in, in It's very office. interesting though that both Bibi and Ehud Barak, who served together in a special unit, were Prime Ministers for a very short period of time. And Yitzhak Shamir was there for a pretty long period. And, uh, uh, Menachem Begin was there for, you know, he resigned on his own. It's, it's pretty interesting. Barack, uh, my, he's in town and he was hugging you today. Uh, I believe we'll have a political comeback. I think the Labor Party, which basically disavowed the election of two weeks ago, Avram Borg was elected and there was a lot of uh, consternation about how the election took yes. place. Fuad Ben Eliezer was the defense minister, challenged him, and today I see that they disallowed it. They're going to have a new election, I think. Uh, I have predicted six months ago that Fuad would become the winner of the Labor Party mm. uh, leadership simply because it's hard to dethrone a defense minister in Israel and not make him a leader of your party. And it's absolute logic. Now, mm. you're a logician because you're a philosopher. You can't reject that philosophy, right? Well, I, I, you don't send them out. Avram Berg, a nice man, but I think I, I, I cannot down. reject your prediction <laughs> that Ehud Barak will do a political comeback. I do so. And by the way, let me tell you that Ehud Barak and Benjamin Netanyahu are both brilliant and extremely intelligent uh, leader. I'm very proud to be in a state that we have such a, a brilliant new uh, leadership. Although, I think that if you examine them, 
uh, in, it's come out for uh, in, in the results, then uh, Bibi was a very successful prime minister. And if you examine Ehud Barak terms in office a year and a half, I think that uh, he brought uh, many disasters. Although he is not the main person to be blamed. The conditions created by Oslo, by the Oslo process, are so difficult and so terrible that it is very, very difficult to maneuver uh, Israel under those uh, conditions and limitations. Yuval, it's always a pleasure to see you whenever Thank you're you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. You, we want to see you again. We're coming back with Dennis Dugan, who is a Pulitzer, Weiss, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, columnist for Newsday, and he's going to talk about New York City, Mr. Kelly, Mr. Pataki, Mr. McCall, and uh, everything else going on in the city, and why Rudy became a world hero. We'll be right back. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high. To have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandon the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening. A book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Long. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. We're back, and we're here with uh, Dennis Dugan. First time on the show, Dennis. He's a Pulitzer yes. Prize winning uh, columnist for Newsday, and he knows politics of this area as well as uh, anybody. Uh, Jimmy Breslin may fight me on that, or Pete Hamill. I go with Dennis Dugan. How's that? Dennis, uh, welcome. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, the politics. Rudy is the world celebrity today. Absolutely. Yeah, right. rescued by uh, the worst <laughs> sort of tragedy. It's uh, I mean, uh, he was, uh, you know, on his way out. And, we say in French, in dread, which means you can imagine what it means. Yes, I can imagine. <laughs> I think you're right. Um, he and was ready to be cooked. Yeah, he had a divorce problem. He had, uh, unfortunately, he was sick. He dropped out of Hillary's campaign. Yeah. And today, uh, you could sell Rudy balloons all over the world. It's amazing. Everybody knows yeah. him. Yeah, it's incredible. He's become. Do you like him, by the way? Um, uh, no, I don't particularly like him. I, love, I don't like uh, the fact that he that uh, he played the race card uh, once too often uh, in s several places where he, he was unnecessarily cruel. Um, and, and I could go through all these instances with you. You're probably aware of them too. But uh, a judge named Hortense Gable, for instance, yeah, I remember he taped he put a tape on her on his on her daughter, right? And uh, had uh, used that as uh, evidence in the trial. 
uh, her, the daughter was uh, not exactly a genius. Uh, and so he was basically I taking advantage of a very little, fragile... A little fragile woman, right? Yeah, right, exactly. And, uh, and, you know, this just went on and on and on. I'll uh, make a prediction, Dennis. Yeah. That Bloomberg and Giuliani at the end of four years will not be friends. I totally agree with that. Uh, yeah. Bloomberg will, you know, even the way he's talking now, now Rudy did help him, we got to admit that. Yep, and his ad spiked him. Yep. But Bloomberg's his own man, a former CEO, he's got a $10 billion company out there. Nobody's yep. going to say, I made Bloomberg. Nobody. No. I agree with you totally in that. And I think, you know, people ask me, what is Rudy going to do? I don't think anybody really cares. <laughs> you know, in this town, in any town, when, when you're out, um, you're out. You're you a know, guy you, sitting on a park bench like Bernard Baruch talking to the wind. You know who was a client of mine at one time? Who? Abe Beam. Oh, was he? Yeah. He was a wonderful, wonderful oh, man. Yeah, I know his son. And, and Buddy, I, Buddy was at my party last buddy, night. Buddy, yes. A wonderful guy, great family. But Abe used to travel on the subway. Yeah. And uh, he used to work at a yes. bank as a chief officer, as basically as a... I mean, after the yeah, mayoralty. After the mayoralty. I saw him on the number six. He would come down on the number six right. train, and I would catch him. And a couple of times I went over to the bank and sat around and talked. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. But basically, he was forgotten. He used to yeah. be invited to some parties here and there. Very few of these mayors uh, can hang in after they leave the mansion. Right. The only exception I know is Koch. Koch somehow manufactured a persona that... Yeah, he's a great guest. He's been on a show a lot. He yeah. also was there last night, but uh, he's got a personality. You can't ignore it, Koch. Yeah, he's, absolutely. He's got a great personality. He's, he's he does uh, about eight things. You know, I can write I, more. Yes, he writes books. He writes poetry. I mean, not books, yeah. books. And uh, he's uh, Robinson Silverman. He's a lawyer there. And yeah. uh, he reviews movies. And he goes on Bloomberg. Right. Then he does the Leon Charney report. I mean, he's an active guy. Yeah. And uh, he does speeches. And he has all these ailments that uh, are come upon him in recent years. He doesn't seem to let that uh, no, stop deter him at all. I have to say, for instance, when Rudy had this prostate cancer, um, I think he overplayed it a little bit since I had the same thing, and I happen to know some of the doctors who were dealing with him. Really? Uh, you know, the prostate cancer community is a very tight little group of people, and we sit around and uh, talk to one another. You have to. Um, and I thought, you know, his situation with that woman, Judy Nathan, right. had become kind of absurd. I mean, you know, trotting this woman around town in front of the cameras. Well, he's got a wife and two children over in the mansion. Uh, that was a, a scene that went way beyond what Clinton did, and yet Clinton was savaged by, mainly by the right-wing press in this country and the chattering classes. Are you excited that uh, Hillary Clinton is your senator and Bill Clinton lives in the state? I'm excited that Bill Clinton lives in the state. Why? Um, uh, well, because I like Clinton. He's smart. Uh, he's got a lot of energy. Um, he's got a good sense of humor. He's a, a good friend of Kinky Friedman, who is a close friend of mine. And uh, he invites Kinky and his father, who runs a... Kinky Kinky? Kinky Kinky. He's a Kinky. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you know Kinky Friedman? No. Well, he's a, a country singer but a New Yorker, and, and uh, he sings uh, very quirky songs, like they don't uh, make Jews like Jesus anymore, is one of his favorites. <laughs> Kink, uh, yeah. And Clinton loves them. In fact, uh, touted a couple of his books for which uh, Kinky will be ever, forever uh, thankful. You know who favorite uh, singer was of uh, Jimmy Carter? Uh, who? Uh, Not Loretta Lynn. No, the guy who did a song with uh, Julio Iglesias. Um, uh, he's about 70 years old, the 70 today, and he wears Willie Nelson. Oh, oh yes, that's right. That's his favorite singer, I yeah. believe. Uh, anytime you talk to Clinton, he talks about Willie Nelson. Yeah. Tell me, yes. Pataki a shoe in At the moment, but, you know, uh, Leon, as you know, politics yeah, is a day-to-day -day thing. Who would believe that Bloomberg would win? Who would? I never believed it. I was shocked. Although I must say on Bill's program that Tuesday. Bill Mazur? Yeah. I had uh, a sudden stroke of genius. He said, who's going to win? And I said, Bloomberg. I predicted that to a Bloomberg reporter, that Bloomberg Is that right? two days before. Yeah. The momentum was just building. That was what it was. It was momentum, plus the Democrats were imploding. I, stuck, I talked to Freddie Ferrer the other day. Did you hear? Who do you, no, on his phone. Oh, he'll, yeah. He'll come on. Uh, my, who do you think he voted for for mayor? 
Um, he probably voted for Bloomberg. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this, you know, I talked to Freddie. I, I was actually very much in favor of Freddie. And uh, he's a good man. Went Freddie. public with that a couple of times. So I uh, went up to the breakfast. They had this breakfast meeting the day after the election. Yeah, but I'm going to tell you what he said then. You're going to laugh. All right. Bloomberg, he, I think Bloomberg offered him a job, and yeah. Freddie didn't want it. So Bloomberg asked him what he's going to do. He says, well, Leon, uh, uh, Mike, I went to the dictionary last night, and I looked up the word retainer. <laughs> <laughs> he needs a little guilt. <laughs> yeah. uh, I asked him the same question, and uh, he gave me a pretty evasive answer. You know, he said, I'm not sure, I'm gonna, but I'm not leaving. I'm going to be hanging around. I'm pretty sure he'll be a candidate the next time around. He's a force. He uh, is a big force and now. And the Latino community is very strong right now. Absolutely. Uh, it, he was really a, a very big part of that coalition that bought down uh, Green. And I'm going to tell you, uh, Dennis, I believe Bloomberg is going to be a good mayor. I do, too. I think... I hate to agree with you. Know, I usually like to you know, disagree. You mean you want to be contentious? Uh, tell me you love Yasser Arafat. Uh, no, I don't love Yasser <laughs> Arafat. But, uh, but I'm surprised uh, that Bloomberg has done so well in the first couple of days. Uh, he's done very smart moves. He's uh, yes. going to see his load of Sharpton, no matter what. He, he went to the saying. union people, the union people Randy and, uh, and uh, he's, Dennis Rivera. Right. And yeah, he ran a big organization. And you can't minimize that. No, you can't. But I, I was surprised because the last businessman who became a mayor in New York was somewhere in the 1880s. I looked it up in the Green Book. Really? And there was a guy who sold flour and yarn. <laughs> uh, and here was a guy who was selling air, basically. Uh, you remember Lou Lehrman? I do. Quite, yes, the Lehrman Ran for governor against uh, Cuomo. Uh, runs Cuomo. Drug. Uh, almost won, by almost the way. Almost beat him, right. Came within an inch of beating him. Right. Yeah. He needed a Rudy uh, endorsement. He would have got over the. Uh, yeah, exactly. But unfortunately, he never got one. But I'm, I'm impressed, uh, as you are, and Pete Hamill wrote a. Valentine to him yesterday in the Daily News, and I'm sure Pete was voting as a Democratic regular. I am a Democrat, so for me to vote Republican, even for a Democrat masquerading as a Republican, which he is, Bloomberg, yeah, yeah, uh, would have uh, perhaps caused my arm to wither and die. What do you think of uh, Kelly? As Ray Kelly, yeah, love Kelly. Really? Yes. Although I, I must tell you that I'm also very fond of. First Deputy Commissioner Joe Dunn, who today said he was not going to stay in office. This is the second time he's been Shut passed up, over. He really? said he feels like the runner-up in a beauty contest. He is. He is. <laughs> yeah, I know. But he doesn't like to lobby, and you have to. You got to lobby for these jobs. You can't just sit there and say, "I hope they notice me." Kelly's a very personal guy. I met him yes. a couple of months ago, and when he was at INS, I believe, or right before Bear Stern. Yeah. He's Let a, me tell you a good story about go Kelly. Ahead. The last day he was police commissioner, we had lunch down in, in the village uh, at a place called the San Remo on Thompson Street. And then we walked over to the 6th Precinct, where he had worked as a foot uh, cop. And uh, he was greeted with great enthusiasm, because cops love guys who have been there with them. Uh, and anyway, we walked back, and we had a cup of coffee somewhere. And I said, I've never seen a commissioner's police badge. Uh, can I see yours? So he said, sure. He pulled out this ratty-looking wallet. You know, one of those wallets that, you know, looked like it was about to disintegrate? Right. But inside the wallet was this incredible piece of jewelry, the badge, $10,000 badge. Really? Yes. And um, I would melt it and go for a tin one, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that afternoon, he had to turn it in. But I asked him, I said, Ray, why are you putting, carrying this thing around in this dreadful-looking wallet? And he said, well, it belonged to his father, and his father was a postal guy, a mailman. Really? Postal clerk. Yeah. So uh, that was my... And he's very well educated. Very yes, few he people is. people understand it. He's got a degree from Harvard. Yes, he does. And he's a lawyer. And he's a lawyer, and his son, I believe, is in the television business over at Channel One. Do the cops like him from the ground up? Yeah, the cops still like him, They're, because they respect a guy who goes out on the street. Uh, I think, you know, also, he didn't uh, take the uh, Pepsi-Cola or whatever it was that you, know, you talk about when you're feeding guys and you get their brains numbed like Mr. Jones did yeah, many years ago. He, he raised a pretty independent guy. And I think probably that was one of the reasons Giuliani bought in his own police commissioner because, again, Kelly refused to lobby for the job. 
And uh, Brad was on this show, by the way. There was real animosity between him and Giuliani. I mean, there was no love there. That's all over. Oh, yeah. Well, read his book. You know, he wrote a book about Bill it. Bill Bratton? Uh, savaging uh, Giuliani. Really? Yeah. Ed Koch wrote a book, Savaging Giuliani. He called it uh, Rudy Giuliani, Nasty Man. Nasty Man. My, my publisher, by the way. Is that right? Barricade Books. Yeah. It's, uh, I, one of the reasons I like Koch, he gets right to the point. I asked him one day about Green, and he said in communist. his own words, communist. obnoxious. <laughs> he, thought, he thought he was a communist. Yeah. I had him on this show. Yeah. And I asked him about Hevesy, Green, at that time he was backing Valone. Right. And uh, he didn't like Hevesy, and he thought Green was, uh, yeah. was socialist or communist. Right. I mean, he's just blunt. Yeah. But in the end, he probably helped uh, Bloomberg. He gave him an endorsement. He probably helped him. Yes, he did give him the endorsement. And I, and I think it, was, it probably helped uh, uh, Bloomberg as well. as, But not the Rudy one was the big one. No question about it. What's curious about Bloomberg, he's already being attacked by the New York Post. Is that right? Um, yeah, they said three days and he's already going left and he's talking to these radical, you know, Stalinists and so on and so forth. And um, which reminded me of a saying that Mike McElroy used to write for them. Uh, when he left, he called it uh, the crash test dummy of American journalism. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and they prove it almost daily. Do they consider themselves journalists or a tabloid, really? Well, they're tabloid, you know, but but you, they do have some good uh, reporters. But uh, there's a party line over there that seeps through every page of that newspaper. You know what they've done? I, I don't read Newsday all the time. I guess I should if you're there. But they have a pretty good business uh, page now, the Post. Yeah, people, they do. A lot of people read it for the for the real estate, for the TV, yeah. and all that. Yes, and, but uh, and your press circulation section. is much bigger than theirs, isn't it? Uh, our circulation is probably around six hundred thousand. And theirs? That's including the Long Island Newsday. Here in New York, we're probably at about one hundred and twenty. You write for both Newsdays? I write for both Newsdays, yeah. Mainly my stuff appears in the New York section. I was hired by Billy Moyers, who oh, was really? press secretary to yeah, Lyndon I know, Johnson. I know, yeah. And uh, probably the best publisher I ever worked for. Because he was a hands-on guy, and he called up and he would tell you if he liked your stuff or if he didn't. Uh, it's very rare. You know, publishers generally go out and do business. But this guy was in the business of journalism. Yeah, he was a journalist. Yeah, he was. Did you see his new book out on Johnson? I haven't read it. Did I hear you? it's terrific. Is it? Yeah. What's the title of it? Do you know? I don't remember, but it's written by Beschloss or Besch the historian. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. He was characterized as Johnson all the way up. He yeah. knew, by the way, which affected all about of Vietnam. us about Vietnam. He really knew he had no way out. You know, and it's I was shocked by that. Uh, revelation. Yeah, I was shocked, you know, that he would continue to feed uh, these young men. It's terrible. Uh, you know, it is the height of cynicism, right. and uh, it made me re revamp my thinking about uh, this president. Years ago, when I was a young lawyer, I debated uh, Sorensen on the Joe Franklin show, radio show, and I, I proved to Sorensen that uh, Kennedy was really the guy who put us into Vietnam. You know, we all think about Johnson and Nixon, but it was yeah. really Kennedy who put all of us into Starting the... Starting with the advisors and right, then amping right, it up right, every right, uh, month or right. so, and another 2,000. Right, and McNamara didn't know where he was going with this, and he has yeah. a lot of guilt on him. You know, he wrote this whole book about it. Right, he confessed in public, and... Uh, um, it's but pretty pathetic, you know? A lot it of is. people went down for that. Yeah. Dennis, what do you make of this rift now between the cops and the firefighters? Tell me about that. Well, you know, there's always been a rift there. Why? They just don't like one another. Is that right? Yeah, because uh, the cops understand that the job they do is confrontational. Uh -huh. The job the firefighters saving, is saving. saving and rescuing. Right. Now, a cop you know, has to draw his gun once in a while, he has to shoot somebody, he has to go into court, he has to be a witness in murder trials. Right. So uh, they, by the nature of their job, they're not uh, cuddly. Firefighters are cuddly. Big, good-looking guys, usually smart. Um, they have a great brotherhood. Yeah, there's a lot of collegiality with them. Yes. One of my closest friends is a retired firefighter named Dennis Smith who wrote a marvelous book, a bestseller, in 1972 called Report from Engine Company 82. He's now doing a book for Viking, which is called Report from Ground Zero. Wow. And uh, w w what I've learned with my association with Dennis is firefighters are just different. And, and, and there's no paucity. A lot of people want to be firefighters. It's a dangerous job. It's a dangerous job, but you know, there's excitement and glamour there, and there's 
the camaraderie of the firehouse. Yeah, it's amazing. I it mean, is we, amazing. We're paying a lot of attention because of Ground Zero. Not yeah. everybody paid attention to them before. I mean, a lot, but not as much as now. Now yeah. they're really heroes. Now they're you really. see them in uniforms now. Yeah. I went to a Nick game the other night. They're in uniform, and they make you feel proud. Yeah. I mean, they, they did a tremendous I think amount. the mayor made a terrible mistake, uh, which he did rectify. I'll give him credit for that. Uh, arresting firefighters. Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, you know, <laughs> and I, to I told one of the guys the next day, I said, you know, this is not going to stand. Oh, that, that, no that, judge in his right mind. It's like arresting Eisenhower, you know, for, yeah, exactly. uh, pulling around exactly. with a woman, you know. Yeah, right. It doesn't work. What is the effect of the Twin Towers, your uh, uh, analysis of it? Uh, Devastating. Devastating. Yeah, I, it's, it's almost a personal insult to me. Right, it is. To have uh, these people come over. You know, it's astounding to me that with you have a guy who lives in a cave in, in the sand. Right. And somehow he goes over and he does more damage to this country with a, with a couple of guys and a couple of thousand dollars and some balling twine and box cutters. Well, he's, they they, they have sleeping agents. I mean, this was pretty yeah. well planned. Oh, I had no question about it. But well, I mean, What do you feel about the economy? Will it rebound? Oh, it always does. You know, this economy... You remember Norman Mailer wrote a piece years ago, or maybe it was Erwin Shaw. War is good for the economy. Oh, it's you know, the, his thesis was, you know, you <laughs> should build all these munitions, put them on ships, send them out to sea, sink them, bring them back and start all over again. That's called military-industrial complex. Yes, Mr. Eisenhower said that. Dennis, My thanks pleasure. for coming on. Always a pleasure. Okay. We, uh, we had two of the best today, and uh, we're hoping that uh, maybe the uh, peace uh, with uh, Israel and the Palestinians will be pushed by George W., and uh, we'll watch it very carefully and report to you next week. Obviously, we'll be tracking Mr. Bloomberg. Uh, we think he'll be doing fine. We'll see you next week. <laughs>